Welcome to the online classroom for the module FIN 3701. Um, in this class, I'm going to be taking you through assignment two for 2022. I'm just going to be taking you through this assignment, explaining some important concepts, how to approach the questions um, as you wrap up this module and focus towards your exam. Now, this assignment consists of, um, should be four questions. Yes, four questions. Uh, the first question has to do with um, determining the price of a share and then determining whether or not we should invest in the share. It's building up on some of your knowledge from earlier modules. Uh, the second question has to do with calculating the costs of different types of capital, the costs of uh, uh, ordinary shares, and then using the weighted average uh, cost of capital and the break point of equity and break point of debt. Uh, the third question is a really common question, past assignments in previous years and also in previous exam questions, whereby you have to calculate the EPS under different uh, capital structures and then you also have to calculate the weighted average cost of capital and then uh, you have to advise which capital structure to invest in in order to maximize shareholder wealth. And then question four is a new type of question. Uh, this question has never been asked before. It has to do with projecting um, uh, a company's and its per share. One company is attempting to purchase another company. And then you have to um, project the earnings per share for the target company and acquiring company uh, into the future. And then you have to advise whether or not a major should uh, proceed. So we can get started. So I'll read out question number one. Uh, we're told that Bonga currently has a portfolio of ordinary shares representing several different companies. And then Bonga considers it to be a well-balanced investment portfolio, but he wants to reduce the overall risk of the portfolio a bit more by including ordinary shares from a company known as Titan Mining Corporation. And then we're given the, the following information with regards to Titan Mining Corporation. Um, we are looking at the period between 2017 and 2020. This company known as Titan, Titan Mining Corporation had dividends of 3.14, 3.55, 3.89, and 3.95 over the previous four years. And then the expected dividend in 2021 uh, is anticipated to increase <clears throat> at the rate at which dividends grew between 2017 and 2020. And then after that, we are told that dividends will increase at 10% per year indefinitely from 2022 onwards. So this is all really important. Uh, Bonga requires a return of 15% of its investment and is not prepared to pay more than 52 rand per ordinary share uh, of Titan, Titan Mining Corporation. And then we are asked to calculate the current uh, price of Titan Mining Corporation's ordinary share. And then after that, he asked should Bonga purchase uh, Titan Mining Corporation shares to include in his investment portfolio, provide reasons for your answer. So this, this first question is a classical question of the multiple stages of growth uh, model that you use a lot in uh, FIM 2601. And um, what you have to do uh, for this particular question, uh, you have to determine the historical growth rate. Uh, you have to determine the historical growth rate based on the previous years that you've been given. So they've been certain years in the past uh, from 2017 to 2020, where dividends were being paid. And then historically, there's a certain growth rate uh, that applied over that particular interval. So you need to first determine that growth rate, that historical growth rate. And then you need to use that historical growth rate to help you to calculate future dividends. 
And then after getting future dividends, you can then determine the price of the share today. So in our particular case, our starting point is going to be to determine the historical growth rate that applied between 2020 and 2017. And to get that historical growth rate, we take the earliest dividend that was received in 2017, and we take the most recent dividend that was received in 2020. So you put the earliest dividend as your present value, and you put the latest dividend as your future value, right? So we put this as follows. <clears throat> Uh, minus 3.14, the earliest dividend is our present value, and we always put that as a negative. And then we put 3.95 as our future value. This is the most recent dividend that was paid in 2020. And then these dividends were paid over three years. Uh, they were paid over three years, uh, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. So this is one year, two years, three years. So these dividends were paid uh, over the course of three years. Um, this 3.14 was paid at the beginning of 2017, and this 3.95 was paid at the end of 2020, uh, at the end of 2020. So uh, these dividends have been paid in fact, we can say that the first dividend was paid at the end of 2017, and then the other last dividend was paid uh, uh, at the end of 2020. Yeah, so that's uh, a three-year interval. One way for you to also remember what your value for N is, is to simply say 2020 minus 2017, and then you get three. A lot of students get confused by the value of N. Some think because you've got four dividend payments, N is four, but that's not the case, no, no, no. Um, the case is to get your N to use when you want to calculate your growth rate. You simply subtract your 2020 minus 2017, or you can draw a timeline, and then you can clearly count that one dividend is paid here, another there, another there, and another there, and this adds up to three years. So we can enter all that information into our financial calculator, put 3.14 as your PV, put N as your three, put 3.95 as your future value. Then you can compute your I over YR, giving you 7.95% um, as your growth rate, right? So this would be your, your growth rate. Okay, so historically, between 2017 and 2020, this is the growth rates that, that applied. So uh, we are being told that uh, that growth rate that applied between 2017 and 2020, that's the rate at which dividends are going to increase in 2021. That's the rate at which dividends are going to increase in 2021. So, and then after that, from 2022 onwards, the dividends will increase at 10%, okay? So we can now use that growth rate that we just calculated, that historical growth rate of 7.95%. We can use that growth rate to help us to get the dividend 2021 by taking the, the, the 2020 dividend multiplied by one plus the growth rate to give us the 2021 dividend and then taking that 2021 dividend multiplied by one plus the growth rate that will apply from 2022 going forward, which is 10%, giving us the 2022 uh, growth rate. And then once, once we've got that 2022 uh, growth rate, um, we can then calculate the price um, at, uh, the, at 2021, right? We can then calculate the price uh, at the end of 2021, right? So we can calculate our price at time 2021. And then to get our price um, at time 2021, um, we simply take the dividend that will be received at the end of 2022. So this is the price at the end of uh, 2022. 
2021 or the price at the time 2021. But let's just grow a timeline to understand what's happening here. Uh, a timeline always helps. Uh, so this is what we are saying is currently happening with regards to these dividends. Um, we are at time 2020, and then at the end of 2021, we are going to receive a dividend of 4.2640, and at the end of 2022, we are going to receive a dividend of 4.6904. So we can calculate the price of the share at the end of 2021 by taking our dividend uh, at the end of 2022 divided by our required return minus the growth rate. So the price at the end of 2021 it's supposed to be the dividend at the end of 2022 divided by the required return minus the growth rate. Okay. So if we do that, we discount this dividend divided by our required return minus the last growth rate. And then we can get the price of our share uh, at the end of 2021. But we want to determine what the price of the share is uh, at the end of 2020. We want to determine what the price of the share is today. We are assuming that we are in 2020. So to get the price of the share uh, <clears throat> at 2020, time 2020, we have to discount the price of the share uh, at the end of 2021, plus the dividend that we're going to receive at the end of 2021. We have to discount our dividend at the end of 2021 and the price of the share um, at the end of 2021, we have to discount the total of those two by our required return. So we then add those two up and then discount by our required return. Then we get the price of the share at the at time 2020, which is where we are. Of course, you could have also used your financial calculator to do this calculation. You could have said 93.8086 plus 4.2640. Uh, giving us 98.0726 as our future value. N would be one because we're just discounting back by one year from 2021 to 2020. Our discount rate would be 15%. And then the answer we get is our PV would be this one. That would be the price of the share. <clears throat> So it is just that simple uh, multiple stages of growth formula that we use uh, for Fin 2601 or other financial management modules. Uh, then that gives us the price of the ordinary share. And then clearly we are told that uh, Bonga is required, it requires a return of 15% on its investment portfolio and is not prepared to pay more than 52 rand per ordinary share. So we have calculated the price of the share to be 85 rand 28, but we've been told that Bonga is not prepared to, to pay more than 52 rand per ordinary share, whereas we are seeing that the price of the share is 85 rand 28. So if Bonga wants to add the share into his portfolio, he would have to pay 85 rand 28, and this is too expensive because his cutoff to invest in the share is 52 rand. So we would then conclude by saying, Wong, I should not purchase Titan Mining Corporation shares to include in, the, in its investment portfolio because the current price per share that we have calculated is greater than the 52 rand we were told in the question as the cutoff price. So this was question number one. <clears throat> we can move on to, to question number two. Question two says, the power systems company Raging Vaults is currently 70% equity financed and aims to raise 2 million to fund a set of attractive investment opportunities. Debt financing may be obtained at an after tax cost of 16%. Uh, the company's management wants to introduce 40% debt in the capital structure while keeping the cost of each uh, financing source together um, with its market value the same, right? 
ordinary shares are currently uh, selling for 30 rand per share. The company paid a dividend. Um, the company paid a dividend uh, of 150 per share in the previous year and at a growth rate of 7% over the past few years. It is expected that this growth rate will be maintained in the future. The company's tax rate is 29%. So then we are asked a number of questions here. Uh, calculate the component costs associated with capital investments financing. Calculate the weighted average cost of capital, the breakpoint of equity and the breakpoint of debt under the current structure. Calculate the WAC, the breakpoint of equity and the breakpoint of debt under the proposed capital structure. Calculate the number of shares under the current structure and calculate the number of shares under the proposed structure. This question had, um, the way it was uh, asked, uh, there were a few concepts which were a bit confusing um, and which really didn't uh, make sense. But given the information we have, I'm going to answer this question in the way that I think is the, is the best way to answer it, given my experience helping students with this module. So uh, I'm going to take you through this question using my own experience as to the best approach on how to answer this question. Some parts of the question are straightforward, others are not so straightforward because the information we've been given uh, might not seem as if it's sufficient. Okay, <clears throat> with regards to part 2.1, it's a bit straightforward. You just want to calculate the component costs associated with uh, capital investments financing. So to answer this particular question, what you have to do, you have to first identify the sources of capital that we've been given in this particular question. And the sources of capital that we've been given are debt and equity. Those are the only two sources of finance. So we need to get the cost of equity and we also need to get the cost of debt after tax, of course. So you clearly have to carefully look Check to see the sources of finance you've been given and then uh, answer your question. So we've been given debt and uh, ordinary shares equity. We haven't been given preference shares, so we don't have to worry about preference shares. Um, and we also have, we haven't been given flotation costs or issuing costs, so we don't have to worry about calculating the cost of existing equity and new equity. Uh, we're just focusing on the cost of equity full stop. We don't have to distinguish between new equity and existing equity because we haven't been told anything about flotation costs or issue costs. Right? So the same applies to debt. Um, so to, to calculate the cost of equity, we can use the, the Gordon Growth uh, formula, whereby we simply take our current dividend, D0, uh, multiplied by 1 plus G divided by price plus the growth rate. So we take our current dividend multiplied by 1 plus our growth rate divided by the current price plus um, our growth rate as a decimal. And then we get 12.35%. Uh, okay. Uh, always be careful to, to check whether you have D1 or D0. Uh, that's one of the important things to check. Uh, price uh, we don't have to worry about net proceeds here. We're just calculating the cost of existing ordinary shares. We haven't been told anything to do with new ordinary shares, such as flotation costs. So we don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> the next part of the question says, calculate the weighted average cost of capital and the breakpoint of equity and the breakpoint of debt uh, under the current structure. Uh, the, the weighted average cost of capital is simple. Oh, okay. It's also important to note here where we are asked to calculate the component costs associated with capital investments financing. We also have to be sure to calculate the after tax cost of debt, but we've been given this already, so there, there really isn't anything to calculate. I just restated it uh, for record sake. And then to calculate our weighted average cost of capital, this is straightforward, right? We've been given our target weights. Um, at 70%, this is the current, uh, under the current structure where we have 70% equity and 30% debt, we can calculate our weighted average cost of capital. 
by taking the weight of the ordinary shares times the cost of uh, ordinary shares, which is 12.35, plus the cost of debt. Remember, if we have 70% of our finance um, coming from, from equity, 70% of our finance coming from equity, it means that 30% of our finance uh, will come from, from debt. So 30% multiplied by 16% plus 70% multiplied by 12.35, that gives us 18.45, that's our weighted average cost of capital, given the current capital structure. Okay, now the part I was referring to when I was saying we weren't really given enough information, but I'm just going to use my own experience in tutoring the small and assisting students as to how we can calculate the breakpoint of equity and the breakpoint of debt under the current capital structure. Uh, remember, when it comes to the breakpoint of equity, uh, we usually say the amount of finance available from equity finance, and we usually assume that's our retained earnings divided by the, the weight of equity in our capital structure. Likewise, for the breakpoint of debt, we usually take the amount that can be raised from debt financing divided by the weight of debt in our capital structure. So given the information we've been given in this question, the only realistic assumption to make here is that this 2 million being referred to, this 2 million grand, this is the source of financing that can be raised from debt, the maximum source of financing that can be raised from debt. And this is also the maximum source of financing that can be raised from equity. So in other words, this, if we're going to raise debt, this is the maximum amount we can raise from debt at this particular after tax cost. And likewise, this is the maximum that we can raise from equity uh, at that cost that we, we calculated as 12.35%. So to then calculate our breakpoint of equity and breakpoint of debt, we can simply take that 2 million divided by the weight of equity to give us our breakpoint of equity. And we can take that 2 million divided by the weight of debt to give us our breakpoint of debt. But like I've been explaining to you, um, given the information that we've been given, usually for these questions, we are explicitly told that the amount that can be raised from debt is such and such an amount, and the amount that can be raised from equity is such and such an amount. And then after having been told those amounts, you can then easily uh, substitute in the relevant values and then calculate what you need to calculate to get your answer. But in this case, we weren't given that information. So given my experience on helping students with questions like this, that would be the, the approach I think would be most given credit. So we can then continue with the same approach for part 2.4, whereby we simply calculate our work using a 60% uh, weighting in ordinary shares, a 40% weighting in debt. Remember, if our debt ratio is now 40%, 40% of your money in debt means 60% of your money in equity. And then we get 13.81 as our weighted average cost of capital. Again, we can divide that 2 million uh, finance with the weight in equity, 2 million finance with the weight in debt, and then that can give us the break point of equity and the break point of debt. So it's exactly the same approach as we used in part 2.2. But the only difference here for part 2.3 uh, is that we are now using 60% and 40% as our weights, okay? And then again, the, the last two parts of the question are another part of the question where I was saying again, the, the wording and the way the question was asked, it can leave students a bit confused. We are asked to calculate the number of shares under each capital structure like under the current structure and then also under the proposed structure. So you're also asked to calculate the number of shares under each of these uh, capital structures. Right? So the best approach to this question, given the information that we have, is to assume that this 2 million, if we have 70% equity in our capital structure, 70% of that 2 million is going to be equity. 
and then we divide that by the price per share. So we are also assuming that the price per share is the book value per share. And then we can get the number of shares under the current capital structure. So it's simply uh, that 2 million uh, that we aim to raise multiplied by 70% if the current capital structure is 70% equity financed. And then we divide that by the, the price per share, which we assume to be the book value per share. And then we get 46,667. Usually we should divide by the, 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 the book value per share, but to me, we are assuming that the market price per share is the book value per share for this. But that's what you should always assume if you're not given the, the book value per share uh, uh, explicitly in the question. The same applies under the 40% the, the debt capital structure. 40% debt means that 60% is your equity finance. We say 60% multiplied by 2 million divided by 30, um, and then that gives us 40,000 shares. Okay. So this question was a bit confusing and a bit tricky because um, there's some information historically you would tend to be given directly, and then uh, it wasn't really given. So you had to, to look at the question carefully and then to, to, to make a lot of uh, deductions and inferences as to what was actually required of you. But um, that is the, the best approach, the approach that I've just gone through as to how to approach this question. Okay. Uh, next, we can look at question number three, uh, which has come up quite a number of times in past assignments and past exams. Uh, question number three says, Hammerson Limited is an, is an all equity financed company with 10,000 outstanding uh, ordinary shares, each valued at the market price of 25 grand. The company has decided to modify its capital structure to capture the tax benefits of debt. The plan is to have a target debt ratio of 30%. The company pays all its earnings as dividends and is subject to a 28% tax rate. The expected sales uh, 530,000 rand, fixed costs are estimated at 250,000 rand, and variable costs are estimated at 30% of sales. Uh, details of the pursued capital structure are as follows. Okay, so currently they have no debt in their capital structure, but they are planning on introducing 30% debt. So if they introduce 30% debt, it means they'll have 30% of their capital structure of debt and then the remaining 70% uh, will be equity because 100 minus 30% gives us 70% equity. And given the before tax cost of debt uh, as 11.75%, and then we are also told, then we are asked a number of questions here that we, we need to answer. The first question is which capital structure would you advise the company to choose? if its objective is to maximize its earnings per share. Then the second question is calculate the weighted average cost of capital for both the current and proposed debt structures. Uh, the third question is which capital structure would you advise the company to choose if the aim is to maximize shareholder wealth? Now, the first part of the question, uh, whereby we have to decide which capital structure in order to maximize earnings per share, we simply have to recreate the income statement. So you have to recreate the income statement under the current capital structure where we have equity only, meaning we have 0% debt, and then also recreate the, the income statement where we have 30% debt in our capital structure. And then after recreating the, the income statement under 0% debt and 30% debt, we can then calculate our earnings per share under each of those capital structures. And then we can pick the capital structure that has the higher earnings per share. So to do this, uh, you first have to determine the total equity uh, under the 0% debt capital structure. You have 10,000 ordinary shares, 10,000 outstanding shares, each share with a price of 25 grand. Again, when you're doing these questions, if you're not given the book value per share, you can assume that the market price per share is the book value per share. 
So in this case, we've been given the market price of 25 rand. We assume that that's also our book value per share. So if we say 10,000 rand times 25, we get 250,000 rand. And then this is our total equity. We simply take our total number of shares times the market price per share, which we assume to be the book value per share. If we multiply those two, we get 250,000 rand. So that's the total equity. And we have 10,000 shares under that current uh, capital structure. Uh, there's no debt, 0% debt ratio, no debt, meaning we don't have any interest expense. Okay. The alternative capital structure is whereby we have 70% equity and 30% debt. So if we have 30% uh, debt, it means our debt will be 30% of 250,000. Uh, giving us 75,000. So we're going to be left uh, with 70% times 250,000, which is 175,000 rand in equity, and 30% uh, of 250,000, which is 75,000 rand in debt. So we are simply taking our total equity finance, then uh, we will borrow and buy back some of our shares, and then that will leave us with only. Um, 70% uh, being equity financed, 70% of our company being equity financed because we have a 30% debt ratio. And then 30% times 250,000 will represent the amount of debt that we actually have, the amount of money we borrow. And then to get the number of shares we will have left under the new capital structure, we simply take our equity finance of uh, 175,000 rand divided by 25 rand per share, giving us 7,000 rand. So at 0% debt ratio, we have 10,000 ordinary shares. If we decide to borrow uh, such that we have a 30% debt ratio uh, and we buy back some of our shares, we're just going to be left with 70% of the ordinary total equity, which gives us 175,000. Then 175,000 divided by the, the market price per share. That means we'll be left with 7,000 shares. And then our debt will be 30% of uh, 250,000, which was our total equity originally, meaning our debt will now be 75,000. And then our interest expense will be 11.75% of our debt giving us 8,812.50. So please really make sure you understand that first part. It builds the foundation for the next part of the question. So what we can then do after that, we can then recreate our income statement uh, with 0% debt all the way down to our net profit and with 30% debt all the way down to our net profit. Our sales will be 530, Variable cost will be 30% of sales, which is 159,000. Our fixed cost will be 250,000. If we subtract our variable cost and fixed cost, we are left with our EBIT of 121,000. Subtract our interest expense at 0% debt, we're left with 121,000. Subtract our interest expense at 30% debt, we're left with 8,812. Our earnings before tax are these amounts. After subtracting interest, notice at 0% debt, we don't have interest expense. Our tax, 28% of each of these amounts, we subtract that. And then we are left with our net profit of 87,120 and 80,775. And then we can then easily calculate our earnings per share by taking our net profits, which is each of these amounts, divided by the preference dividends, which we assume to be zero because we haven't been told anything to do with preference dividends yet. And then we divide those amounts by the number of shares, and then we get our earnings per share for each capital structure. And then clearly, <coughs> we can see that under the 30% debt capital structure, our earnings per share is higher than under the 0% debt capital structure. So we pick the 30% debt capital structure. And remember, notice the difference in the number of shares. Under 0% debt, we have 10,000 shares. Under 30% debt, we have 7,000 shares. So even though the net profit has actually gone down from the higher capital structure to the lower one, 
because we now have a less number of shares under the new capital structure, the earnings per share has actually gone up. So we pick the 30% debt ratio due to the higher earnings per share. The next part of the question has a lot of marks. It asks us to calculate the weighted average cost of capital for both the current and proposed debt uh, structures. So um, to, to, to calculate the cost of equity under both of these capital structures, we simply um, take our, we assume there's no growth. Like this is what the textbook does with regards to, to calculating the cost of equity under uh, these capital structures. We haven't been told anything about the growth rate yet. So we assume that there's no growth and we, we simply take we simply take our dividends, right? Um, and we assume that the company pays all its earnings as dividends, so there's no growth. So we simply take each of our dividends divided by the price. Um, and those, remember, the, if we, we take the earnings per share, right? So we assume that all of these earnings per share are paid out as dividends. The company doesn't keep any of its earnings. It pays out all of its earnings as dividends, right? So we, we simply take those earnings per share of uh, 8.71 and 11.54, and then we divide those earnings per share by the, the, the current price. So we divide those earnings per share by the current price, and then we get the cost of equity um, under each scenario, right? So this is the cost of equity at 0% debt. Uh, this is the cost of equity at 30% debt, okay? And then, of course, at 0% debt, we don't have uh, the cost of debt after tax because there is no debt. But at 30% debt, uh, we take the cost of debt before tax multiplied by one minus the tax rate, giving us the after tax cost of debt. And then we can then simply calculate our weighted average cost of capital again, weight of debt times cost of debt after tax plus weight of equity times cost of equity. Here we assume 100% of our finance is coming from equity as we multiply one by the cost of equity giving us 34.84%. Whereas here, <clears throat> we take the weight of debt multiplied by the cost of debt after tax, uh, weight of debt being 30%, plus the weight of equity times the cost of equity. And then that also gives us uh, 34.85%. So you'll notice that these two work values are actually more or less the same. They're actually just more or less the same, right? And then the last part of the question says, uh, which capital structure would you advise the company to choose if its aim is to maximize shareholder wealth? If the aim of the company is to maximize shareholder wealth, you can use this really important formula uh, for determining the, the value of the firm. Uh, whereby we take our EBIT uh, multiplied by one minus the tax rate uh, divided by the weighted average cost of capital. So we the, the EBIT is the same under both capital structures. Sorry, this is actually thirty percent debt. It's not. Uh, it's not. Um, fifty percent. It's thirty percent debt here. So we say 0% debt capital structure, 121,000 times 1 minus 0.28 divided by our work, we get 250,000. Likewise here, 121,000 times 1 minus 0.28 divided by our work, we also get 250,000. So I know that these answers, so this, please note this is 30% debt, right? So I know that these two answers, um, appear to be slightly different here, but they're actually the same. I remember doing this question uh, a few years ago for, for, with another group, and um, you you were just supposed to, to finally take these two as the same, it's the same. I know the difference is like five rand, but it's insignificant. If you round them both off, um, they are both 250,000 rand. So clearly then we can see that neither capital structure is better than the other capital structure. Uh, if the aim is to maximize shareholder wealth, as both of them are giving us the value of the firm 
as 250,000 rand. So we can't clearly say why it's better than that. So please know this is 30%. Um, if you will look at your PDF, I will have uh, fixed that is 30%, not 50% there. So finally, uh, we can look at question 13. Uh, now this question says, consider the following preliminary information about a bidding company or gold mining and the target company Silver Enterprises at the end of the year 2020. So all gold mining at 600,000 ordinary shares outstanding and at earnings of 1.6 million. All gold mining earnings are expected to grow at an annual rate of 5%. Silver Enterprises at 100,000 rand ordinary shares outstanding and at earnings of 200,000 rand. Silver so enterprises uh, earnings are expected to grow at an annual rate of 10%. So we are asked firstly calculate the next five years uh, earnings from 2020 to 2024. These are the next five years earnings per share for all gold mining before the merger. Uh, calculate the next five years, uh, 2020 to 2024 earnings per share for silver so enterprises before the merger. So this is this is one of the areas where a lot of questions haven't been asked before, and it can be a bit intimidating and confusing, especially questions to do with mergers and acquisitions. <clears throat> it's not something that there isn't a lot of material on it in the, in the study guide, but the textbook does go into it in detail, and it hasn't been asked a lot in past assignments, but it's still important to be familiar with this. Just like the, the section on dividends, the different ways to pay dividends, like share buybacks, script dividends, and so forth. So in this case, we, we have a company called All Gold Mining, and that company wants to purchase, wants to acquire silver enterprises right at the end of the... Uh, and then we're given part information to do with these companies uh, as of the end of the year 2020. We're, we're told that all gold mining at 600,000 shares outstanding, silver enterprises at 100,000 grand ordinary shares. We're given the total uh, earnings for the end of the year 2020 for gold mining and for, for silver enterprises. And we're told the earnings will grow at 5% and 10% respectively. So the first part of the question is a bit simple. Um, you just have to calculate the earnings for, for all gold mining uh, for the next five years. Yeah, you're simply growing these 1.6 earnings by 5% from 2020 to 2024. And then each year, you're dividing by the number of shares. And then that will give you the EPS for all gold mining before the merger at the end of each year. Uh, the, the same applies for, for silver enterprises, right? You're simply taking these earnings of 200,000, and then they grow by 10% each year. Uh, for the next five years. And then for each year, for each of those years, you're growing the earnings by 10%. You divide them by the number of ordinary shares, and that will give you the earnings per share uh, for each year. So, so it would be something like this. Uh, grow the, the earnings for gold mining um, by a corporation by 5% each year, showing the calculations, then divide by the number of shares uh, each year to give us the earnings per share. Do the same for silver enterprises. Grow the earnings by 10% each year for five years, and then divide by the number of ordinary shares the calculations are given. So clearly here, we can see that currently the earnings for gold mining are more than the earnings for silver enterprises. Uh, all the way up until 2024, we're gold mining have three rand twenty four per share, whereas silver, the one that wants to be purchased, will just have twenty two point nine three per share. So clearly, we can see that gold mining is currently giving more profits to each of its shareholders compared to silver enterprises. Um, yeah, and always remember with the earnings per share, always be careful to check if there are any preference share dividends that need to be subtracted before. The next part of the question says, calculate the next five years, 2020 to 2024 earnings per share for silver enterprises uh, after the merger, assuming a 1.1 exchange rate. Okay, 
So this is really, uh, really important, uh, this exchange rate. This exchange rate tells us how shares are going to be swapped in the merger. Okay. So, um, to get the total number of shares, so this is what's going to happen, right? <clears throat> each, each shareholder, just to, to make it make sense, each shareholder in um, the target company, uh, the target company in this case uh, is Silver Enterprises, right? So this is the company that wants to be purchased, right? So each shareholder in Silver Enterprises is going to get 1.1 new shares in um, gold mining for each for each share uh, they have in in silver enterprises yeah this 1.1 1 .1, uh, exchange ratio is telling us that for each uh, each shareholder, it's telling us that each shareholder in, in, in Silver Enterprises, which is the target company, each shareholder in Silver Enterprises is going to get 1.1, is going to get 1.1 uh, new shares in gold mining in the target company for each uh, of their existing shares in Silver Enterprises. So what does that mean? That means if you currently have 10 shares um, in silver enterprises, if you currently have 10 shares in silver enterprises, uh, you are going to be bought out. You're going to become part of gold mining uh, company. And by doing that, gold mining company is going to give you 10 times 1.1 which is 11.1 shares uh, in gold mining. So what will happen if you have 10 shares in silver enterprises, these 10 shares are going to be bought out by gold mining. And what gold mining is going to do, they're going to, to, to buy out the, the, the existing company, and then you are going to be given 11.1 shares in the, the company that's buying so you are ex initially ex you are actually you are actually exchanging ten of your existing shares in silver enterprises for eleven point one shares in gold mining. So that's how the acquisition takes place. It takes place in the form of an exchange ratio. So for every one share you have in silver enterprises, you are going to get one point one new shares in gold mining. Inc. So we're actually seeing that you're actually getting something a bit higher than what you actually currently had. So we can use uh, the following formula. So what we have to do for us to be able to get the, the after major earnings per share in silver enterprises, we first have to get the after major EPS in gold mining, right? And remember gold mining is the company that's purchasing silver enterprises. So to get the, the, the after major EPS in gold mining each year, we take the earnings of gold mining uh, each year plus the earnings of uh, silver enterprises each year. And we have those earnings already, right? Those are just these earnings. We have those earnings for each year, these projected earnings. We just take each of these earnings for each year and we add to the market for 2020, 2021, and so forth. And then we divide those earnings by, we divide those earnings by the number of shares of the acquiring company, which is the number of shares of gold mining, plus the exchange ratio, which is 1.1, multiplied by the number of shares of the target company, which is Silver Enterprises. So we do that for each year to get it, to give us the, the earnings per share for gold mining each year. So let me just show you, for example, how we would do that for 2020, and then you can actually recalculate that yourself. So for 2020, what we would do, we would take the, the earnings for, for gold mining, which is the, the company, the acquiring company, 
plus the earnings for silver enterprises, right? Divided by the number of shares in gold mining, which is uh, 600,000, plus our exchange ratio times the number of shares in silver enterprises. So we do this for each year. Of course, the denominator will remain the same for each year, it won't change, but what will change each year is the, the numerator. And then if you divide these two for 2020, if you divide these two for 2020, you get 2.54. And then you can do the same for 2021. You take 1,680,000 uh, 1, <clears throat> uh, plus 220,000, right? Uh, divided by uh, 600,000 plus uh, 1.1 times, sorry, it's actually 100,000. Uh, let me quickly. Sorry, this is actually it's actually hundred thousand year. Right? The number of shares. Sorry about that. The number of shares in the in the target company is actually hundred thousand. It's not two hundred thousand. Sorry about that. So let's actually see. Sorry about that. Um, it's actually one point six plus two hundred thousand giving us 1.8 for 2020 i had mistakenly said 200 000 shares here it's actually uh, 100 000 shares uh, for the target company 600 plus 1.1 times 100 000 uh, gives us 710 000 and then 1.8 divided by uh, 710 000 we get 2.54 okay so that's for for 20, 2020. So we, we would then do the same for 2021, 2022, yeah, 20. I mistakenly said 200,000 shares, therefore for the for the target company, it's actually 100,000 shares. Okay, I'm just correcting that. And then once we have the, the after major EPS uh, for silver enterprises, you need to, for, once we have the after major EPS for gold mining, which is the acquiring company, we can take uh, those uh, after major EPSs for the acquiring company, which is gold mining, and we can multiply each of them by the exchange ratio of 1.1. And then that will give us the, the EPS for, for the company that's being acquired, which is Solar Enterprises. So you can actually read that more of this in your prescribed textbook on the chapter on majors and, and so forth. It's talked about in detail. Uh, how a major affects EPS, how to calculate the post-major EPS and so forth, and what happens with regards to comparing the price to earnings ratio before and after, and a lot of other important concepts that uh, would be important for you to know for the exam. So please remember here yeah, the number of shares is 100,000, it's not 200,000. I mistakenly said 200,000, right? But we fixed that and we've discussed it. So that's how you would do the, the calculations here. There are many ways to do these calculations. This is one of the approaches I've used, but you can also get the same answer just formulating your answer, writing it out in a different way. The last part of the question says, should uh, silver enterprises continue with the major, provide the reason for your answer? And my answer was, uh, the post-major EPS for silver enterprises, as you can see, 2.79, 2.94, 3.11, is more than its pre-major EPS. You see 2.79, 2.94, it's more than uh, 2 and 2.2 and 2.4. So this is silver enterprises before the major. And then the EPS of silver enterprises after the major is much, much higher. And uh, the reason this occurs is because the exchange ratio of one to one means that the acquiring company, in this case, um, Gold Mining Corporation, is paying a premium uh, to acquire silver enterprises, hence the exchange ratio of one to one. So what Gold Mining has effectively done, they've transferred some of their own pre-major earnings the shareholders of silver enterprises. So silver enterprises is actually now benefiting because look at this, 
before the merger, gold mining at 2.67, 2.8, 2.94 projected earnings per share. But after the merger, the earnings of gold mining have actually gone down to 2.54, 2.68 from 2.67 to 2.8, 2.94 and so forth. And then that, that decrease in earnings per share has actually been transferred to the shareholders of silver enterprises who are now actually better off with a higher earnings per share now compared to what they had at the beginning. And this is due to the exchange ratio of one to one, which means the company that's actually acquired silver enterprises has paid a premium. They've actually paid more than what the shares of silver enterprises are worth. And because of that, they transferred some of their earnings per share to the shareholders of silver enterprises. So silver enterprises are now really much well off compared to what they were before. So the, the major should go ahead. So it's important for you to just read up on majors and acquisitions before the exam, the effects of these majors or acquisitions on earnings per share and uh, what that means. Also, you can read up on market prices. The exam could come with market prices on majors and, and acquisitions. So it's just important to, to take note of that. So thank you very much. That brings us to an end of the discussion class on assignment two for 2022 semester two. I hope the class has been helpful. Any questions or queries, please, please, please feel free to, to let me know. Um, I, all, I, I won't always be able to get back to you quickly, but I'll always try to do so as soon as I can. Um, uh, all the best with your studies. Yeah, thanks.